just wait for one or two people to join us here. Okay. What are things like in Wisconsin today? Um, it looks sunny out when I peeked outside, but I have I have just I let the dog out, and that was pretty much it. <laughs> okay. How about you? Um, it is. I'm trying to think of what it would be in Fahrenheit over here. It's probably. Uh, uh, it's pro what is it? It would be about uh, 50, 55. All right, that's yeah. not bad. For us northern people, right? That's pretty good. That, that's right. That's right. Okay, so let, let's see if we can see if there are a few people on here. Um, okay. If there's if there's anybody right now out there uh, watching this, oh, we have a bunch of people <laughs> commenting. So we do. Okay. Cool. All right, so uh, welcome everybody to another online chat here uh, on Facebook Live. And uh, as, as always, it's great when you comment uh, and let us know where you're from. And so far, I see we have people, Ryan, tuning in from Barcelona, uh, from Mexico. Uh, so that's wonderful. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, begin by saying I'm really overjoyed to have my doppelganger of sorts. <laughs> Uh, who I met in Stockholm, uh, Sweden in 2017. Uh, Ryan and I, this is Ryan McAdams, uh, and Ryan and I were uh, joint, or not joint, we were both given the opportunity to speak at the 99 and ICU meetup uh, and had a great time there in Stockholm and mm -hmm. have maintained a friendship uh, and collegiality ever since. And uh, during these times, uh, we wanted to, or I wanted to um, explore uh, through discussion a little bit of how people are doing and coping with COVID and other issues, as, as you'll soon hear. So um, before I get into speaking to Ryan, uh, asking him questions, I'll tell you a little bit about Ryan. Um, so Ryan is a neonatologist, believes every child everywhere deserves the best opportunities to thrive. Um, he hopes to improve neonatal, outcome, neonatal outcomes globally by partnering with people to promote education, and research that leads to sustainable healthcare practices. His experience in the US Air Force, I believe for 10 years as a major uh, and doing volunteer work in volunteer medical work in Peru, Mongolia, Cambodia, Zambia, Malawi, and Uganda have provided him with global insight on newborn health. As, an, as neonatology division, division chief at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and Unity Point Health Meritor, uh, the busiest delivery hospital in Wisconsin, he is committed to reduce racial disparities that hinder neonatal health locally and globally. As a PI or co-investigator on several university and NIH funded grants, he has significant experience in clinical and translation research, including the design, implementation, and data analysis of projects focused on perinatal lung and brain injury. He continues to build on his experience with a passion towards improving neonatal care through an academic pathway. His goal is to lead his neonatology team to help provide perinatal health equity in the community and globally. So with that, overjoyed to have you here today, Ryan. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you, man. Yeah. yeah. And I want to give a big shout out. It's International um, Year of the Nurse and Midwife and this week's National Nursing Week. So totally appreciate all that nurses do, especially with what's going on in the world with COVID. But i um, very grateful. Um, for our nurses. So I just want to make sure we give them some props today, all right? Okay, wonderful. And I and I would also like to give a little shout out back from Carmelita Moore, Nix Williams, who says hello from Travis Air Force Base, California. Yeah, I'm yeah, you were in the Air Force. Care. I see Carmelita. I took care of her son, Jordan, when I was <laughs> a, in my pediatric residency. And then um, Bree Gibbons is on from the, the, the West Coast. Um, and I took care of her little guy, Devin, who just had a birthday, um, but when I was in um, mm -hmm. working in Seattle. So it's, it's cool to see some of these people uh, tuning in. Okay, well, let's, uh, we, don't, we don't wanna take up too much of people's time today because we realize that uh, people are busy battling uh, COVID and taking care of babies who have other uh, afflictions as well. So um, one of the things that I wanted to explore today is given that um, I'm in Canada, you're in the US, um, and um, as people know, I had written the, and have written 
and continue to update the Canadian Pediatric Society practice points. Um, so the, the CPS and the AAP, the approach to delivery uh, differs in how we use N95 masks with, in Canada, us not recommending uh, at the moment the use of N95 masks at delivery, but in the US, the approach was uh, in the AAP document to administer or to use the N95 masks for any delivery where you had a person under investigation or mm -hmm. uh, who was COVID-19 positive. So the question I have for you, Ryan, is one of the um, concerns that we here in Canada had when we heard about the approach being offered in the US was given shortages of PPE, how was this going to hold up? And so I guess my question to you is uh, not to be judgmental necessarily of, of, of one or the other, but what is the experience? Um, are you burning through a lot of PPE? Are there shortages? Maybe you can comment. Yeah, so this that was a huge concern initially, right? Like supply and demand and concern for um, healthcare worker safety and patient safety. Uh, we modified our approach in the sense that we will use our masks longer than we normally would have. We'll cover them with a barrier mask to protect them. Um, and we've also, as screening or testing capacity has increased, it's helped us um, decipher who may or may not place us at risk. So at our hospital, all the pregnant moms are now being screened. So when they come in for delivery, we screen them. We turn around time for that is three to four hours. And so Right. Often we go ahead of time if they're positive or not. And if they're asymptomatic, um, we still want to know if they're positive. Um, so if they're negative, um, that helps us because then we don't necessarily need any of that. Um, we don't need the N95s, essentially. We still are wearing a barrier mask, um, face shield, gown, gloves. The concern, obviously, okay. if there's aerosolizing procedure for the mom. And as you know, with what we do with babies, often we need to intubate them or place them on CPAP or high-flow nasal cannula. So there's a theoretical risk there, but we've been fortunate that um, the PPE, we've been conserving it, but it hasn't turned into um, a dilemma as far as excessive shortages or anything that's compromised their care. So, so when did you start doing the, or using the rapid turnaround test? Um, you know, the tests, some of the tests actually at, the, at our level four hospital can be as quick as like a 15 minutes if, they're, if a kid's gonna go to the operating room a baby's uh -huh. operating room, but the three to four hour turnaround time, you know, went from, you know, when some of us were tested, we found out like two days later, then it was like seven hours and then down to three or four. And that's been more recently. So I think as the, the resources have become available to do those more rapid tests, fortunately we've had um, enough supply and um, we try to be selective, but as time has went on, um, supplies become more available, which has been good. Wow. All right, well, and, and so just curious, I mean, one of the hottest topics about COVID-19 and the newborn is this whole subject of vertical transmission. And yeah. you, you will be reading the same literature I am, and mm -hmm. both, we're both division heads. Um, and so how, how do you, you know, when people come to you, what are you telling them as far as uh, whether you think this is a reality or not? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think early on, this was a huge concern, right? We just didn't know. And as time has went on, and there's been over 3 million cases worldwide, um, there certainly were some initial reports that suggested the potential for vertical transmission. I think on reanalysis, the more recent literature that's come out within the past month or month and a half, mm -hmm. um, ha believes it's that vertical transmission certainly has not been proven. Um, horizontal transmission, we think, certainly happens. But I think there's a lot of unknowns still about the risks for the baby based on interpartum, you know, risk during the pregnancy and then our management afterwards. So I think it seems like right now we're not really seeing it. And I think we still have, we still need more data. I think that's the thing. We need good data to make good decisions. And right now we're still lacking in a lot of that, but given the number of cases, um, mm -hmm. babies are getting it. I think they just are likely getting it through horizontal. I think if vertical transmission is happening, it's pretty rare. Um, at least that's what it seems at the moment. Yeah. Well, thanks for that answer. And I, I'd like to shift gears, stay, staying on the COVID topic, but just moving into a completely different area that we've never really covered, or I've never covered um, on, on these sessions is the subject of racial, racial disparity, yeah. which I know is a passion of yours, at least investigating racial disparity is a passion of yours. Mm -hmm. So what have you seen with respect to COVID-19 in the U.S.? Um, in, in this regard? You know, so our, you know, we have a country of like 330 million people. So we're the third largest country in the world. And 
we certainly are seeing some, uh, the epicenter for this was New York City. And, you know, New York City's got around 8.7 million people. What we're seeing there though, is that uh, there was definitely, um, and there's some recent reports looking at the different boroughs where it appears people that are more poor and people in the black population seem to be more affected by this. And I think it's easy to think of COVID maybe as the great equalizer, but I think what it's been is um, it's been a revealer of the great gaps that exist in our society. Um, so I don't think the virus discriminates, but it's revealed, I think, the, the deep wounds and realities of discrimination in our country. So if you look at places like throughout the whole country, if you look at black communities, the infection rate's about three times higher and the death rate's about six times higher than it would be for white population. Um, cities like Chicago, which are nearby, um, 2.71 million people. You've got uh, there about 30% uh, of the pop, 30 percent of the population being black, but around 60% of the cases, 50% of the cases of COVID are in that population, 70% of the deaths. You're seeing the same thing in Louisiana and some other big cities. And so we're seeing a, a large discrepancy. And the question is like, why is that? And why is that? Yeah. And I think what gets it gets attributed to is concomitant comorbidity. So you have certain phenotypes that are higher risk. So if you're older, if you have diabetes, if you have hypertension, cardiovascular disease, obesity. Um, but the reality is there's a lot of social determinants of health, where you live, where you work, where you get educated that are playing a huge role in this. And these are longstanding complicated issues. Um, but they're probably like, those are the reasons those folks have those comorbidities because they're living in areas of poverty, high population density, areas where it's hard to access good healthcare, healthy food. And I think it sets folks up for a lot of these um, disparities that we're seeing. And I, so for me, it's a, it's a huge issue that it's been there in our country. And I think these numbers may come to surprise, you know, be a surprise to some folks when they see them in the media. But I think if you were to go talk to folks that live in those areas, talk to the black folks, talk to the Hispanic folks, they won't be a surprise because they live it every day and they know of these inequities. And I think that's the, the challenge is like, how are we gonna address that moving forward? Yeah. And I guess that that's the next frontier, isn't it? Is figuring out how to, you know, once you identify the problem is how do you fix it? Yeah, what uh, programs, policies, what, what are we gonna implement that's gonna try and help these folks that we haven't done thus far? And I think there, there's a huge opportunity in front of us. I just, it's up to us to make that choice. And we have freedom in America, so we can choose to do this if we want. I think we just, but this COVID-19 has certainly um, highlighted a lot of these inequities. And, and I, I'm hesitant to ask, because I, 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 I'm re always reluctant to get political on this sort of, this is a medical uh, you know, forum. Sure. But I, I will ask, um, you know, does the government at the moment have any programs or any plans to address these inequities? Um, you know, it's, there's certainly been a call within the, the you know, in, in a lot of journals and literature, with medical community. I think th there's a raised awareness. If you look at a lot of the newspapers around the country, this has been raised in articles. So I think um, it's up to our leaders to, to think about this and see how they're going to allocate resources to try and really invest in these communities that are, I think, most vulnerable. They were vulnerable when we were doing well. They're more vulnerable now. I think Investing is the right thing to do. It's also a smart thing to do because longitudinally, it actually is a, it's financially smart. Okay. Um, so Ryan, you've, you've been great uh, with providing, you know, information about um, racial disparities. And I just wanted to, you know, finish with one last question for you, which has to do with another passion that I know you have, um, having to do with racial disparities, especially in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. um, with respect to breastfeeding rates. and. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the audience would really like to hear, you know, what's going on in Wisconsin and what are you planning on doing about it? Yeah, so Wisconsin, unfortunately, has the, if you're a black baby, it's the highest uh, black infant mortality rate of all the states in the U.S. So it's around 14.8 per thousand, 14.3, um, 14.8. So it's high. It's three times higher than if you're a white baby. If you're a black mom, your risk of dying during pregnancy or after delivery is three times higher than if you're a white mom. Um, so these are disturbing numbers. In some areas, like in Milwaukee, um, infant mortality rates as high as 18 per, th um, per thousand. So it's, it's dramatically high. Um, breastfeeding rates are also, um, exclusive breastfeeding rates are the lowest in Wisconsin compared to other states um, if you're a, a black baby. Um, we know this trend um, in general, like 
black mothers tend to not breastfeed as much exclusively as white mothers or Hispanics. And we think this likely, it's a multifactorial issue, um, and it, but it likely is an upstream indicator for some of the downstream effects as far as maternal health and infant health. We know that exclusively breastfed infants have lower mortality. Um, and, and when moms breastfeed, um, their health improves as well. And so there's probably multiple reasons why this happens. Um, there's cultural reasons, um, socioeconomic reasons. Um, within the community, there's access reasons. And there's just also the information that is available to these moms. So one of the things we want to do here, we did an analysis that showed if you're a white baby in our hospital, your breastfeeding rates around 84% exclusively when you leave. If you're black, it's around 57, 58%. So huge difference. And we worked with um, some community workers, some a, a team of doulas from uh, the Harame Village doulas who um, these women can help provide support during the pregnancy, um, during delivery and afterwards to um, social and emotional support, um, help moms with resources, um, help them to kind of um, break down some of the barriers that exist that prevent the breastfeeding from happening. So this, we got a grant through a hospital, the Meritor Foundation, and we've been working with doulas and people in the community to try and help um, improve exclusive breastfeeding rates so that all our babies get that benefit of breast milk. Yeah, that's certainly something we could all stand to work on. Um, yeah. I, I, I commend you in uh, Wisconsin there for actually taking notice of the issue and you know trying to do something about it. Uh, you know, Collecting the data is one thing, uh, doing something to improve mm -hmm. uh, your outcomes and, and, and improve breastfeeding rates in the at-risk populations is, is very commendable. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'd like to just, you know, before we end, I just wanted to draw uh, people uh, people's attention here uh, to what's behind you, which are a number of paintings. Um, mm -hmm. We're not going to talk about them right now, except I do want people to know that uh, you are speaking to an artist uh, who's not just a neonatologist, but an artist. Those are all original McAdam paintings. And uh, we're going to do another one of these sessions in the near future where we're going to talk about what Ryan is planning on doing with all of this artwork mm -hmm. uh, because uh, it's very inspirational. And I think um, people, people might not just want to hear about it, but might ultimately one day want to help with some yeah. of the endeavors that you're planning on doing. So That'd be great. Uh, Ryan, Ryan, I would say uh, stay safe. Um, Thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to talk to people today. Yeah. Uh, great being able to speak to somebody who's actually in the U.S. who is living uh, through a period, this period, this historic period. Um, and I wish you, your family, and everyone you work with a safe day, safe month, and that we'll get through this and come out the other side. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate the opportunity. Yep. You too. Okay. Stay safe, man. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.